I hate Yu-Gi-Oh. And I have never had fun playing Yu-Gi-Oh. I've never once enjoyed playing this game. And I have certainly never pursued a relationship with a girl almost entirely based on shared interest in it. With that having been said, let's talk about it some. So, lately, I ran into a user, who I will not name, but you can literally just back read, because I'm going to tell you it was in the MBT server. I got into an argument with them about uh, innovation in Edison format. And I said, Edison format hasn't really been that innovated, compared to, like, not as much as what people like to claim. Um, like, it's obviously, you know, got some, some different stuff going on in it, but for the most part... It's nothing that we didn't really know back in 2009-2010. You can argue with me all you want about it, but it's it's kind of but it's true that Edison players like to uh, toot their own horn about uh, you know how far along their supreme format has come. Of course, I'm not here to shit on Edison. I, I mean, I could do that in a million videos, but today I'm here to shit on the community. So. This uh, this is probably going to start. This is probably going to be a series of me just uh, like uh, podcast style ranting about the game. But uh, one thing that I hate about the community, uh, the main thing, is that uh, it's just uh, the arrogance. And I mean, that's rich coming from me. That's, it really is. I mean, I'll, I'll fully admit that. I mean, but the argument that we had was because this person said that players back then were just not as good at building decks as they are now. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a very pervasive, uh, opinion it's it's regurgitated as well i mean it's it's literally regurgitated off reddit i mean i don't think anyone who's like very seriously in tune with the history of the game thinks that like people didn't know anything back then but it's it seems like people who are relatively recent players to the game like really think god everyone was so terrible no one knew what they were doing the, the, you like everyone, even the best players were terrible back then. We know so much more, we're so much smarter now. It's weak history. Vera taught me that term, but it's weak history. It comes from a it's, uh, it's like a British like type of um, uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can look it up, but basically, weak history means in a broader sense than, than the original British terminology that it's like the past was horrible and awful and, and all progress into in through time is progress toward enlightenment. And um, it's basically how people view older Yu-Gi-Oh formats and players for whatever reason. And um, really, it, it's, it's honestly just not true. Uh, the average player is not actually much better than they used to be uh, at playing or deck building. People seem to think that the second Patrick Hoban released uh, Road of a King, we were in the most enlightened era known to man. Everyone was now a premier top deck builder. Everyone has all the information they could want at their fingertips, which is kind of true because of the internet. But internet or not, most players suck. And this guy got really mad when I told him that he's not better than the average player from 2010, no matter how much he thinks he is. He's not actually any better than the average player. He does not have some insane, deeper understanding of the game. And maybe he does. Maybe he's some secret pro that I've just never heard of before, but I highly doubt it if he's going to argue with me over whether or not Jeff Jones could win a duel in 2010 versus 2022. Obviously, Jeff Jones is a very good player. And uh, he could play his exact uh, Edison deck from the SJC and uh, probably do incredibly well. Does not mean his deck is optimal, and I never claimed it was. But uh, It's just funny that people seem to think, like, it's, it is a seriously, like, real pervasive idea in this game that we used to not know anything. And once you are, like, 
kind of deeply ingrained in retro formats, like I am, like like Vera is, like uh, people like James Ark. Um, you know, you just you kind of have this understanding that like back in the day, especially if you, especially if you played back in the day, like they did. Like I, I didn't start playing 2014 like competitively. I, I played before that, but, but, I, but I didn't start playing competitively 2014. So like I don't actually know like you know like I, I know things, but I wasn't like there to experience them firsthand like they were. But what I do know is that from having played all these retro formats, that modern deck building theory kind of just doesn't work. It's like Upstart Goblin doesn't work in a lot of older formats. Um, life points legitimately do matter, and sometimes it can actually make you lose the game. Now, you would, you ask anyone uh, playing Edison coming straight from current, and we're going to say, why is Upstart not in every deck? That's like the first question that I that I see, uh, like half the time from players who are new to Edison coming from current. Why is Upstart not in every deck? It's a three. Oh my god, Upstart is so broken. You can play a thirty-seven card deck. Well, I mean, no, you, you, yeah, sure, sure you can, but um. But you shouldn't, in most decks. Um, and it's one of those things, it's, it's just one of those things that's funny to me, because people are so, like, not self-aware of, like, the stuff that they, like, are, are saying, like, and, and that it's just stuff that's been said a million times and hasn't been true for any of them. <laughs> like, players in 2010... Were believe it or not, not terrible. Every top player has built their decks for a specific meta. So when you look at a list from 2010, or just from any retro format during the time period, you're going to see lists that are a little all over the place. Because they are building for a wider field. Obviously our decks are going to look a bit more streamlined in 2022. That's not necessarily innovation, that's because we have fewer people playing. So we have fewer things to worry about. And it's not really modern deck building theory that's getting anyone there. In fact, if you look at most of the uh, most of the topping lists from like like Ribbit events, uh, from kind of like any any kind of Edison event, the decks that are winning don't look like they're deck built in a modern way. Like look at uh, look at Pro Storm's list. From Ribbit Rulers, literally, 42 cards with, uh, okay, I guess 42 cards with some draw cards is kind of a modern idea. But, like, six recruiters, um, multiples of a boss monster that you don't really want to draw the opening too often, but you, you just, you kind of just have to see it. That's modern. Like, like the, the three Christia thing is kind of modern, but, like... Like, randomly teching, like, Cyber Valley. It's not random, actually, but, but like, playing Battle Traps, playing, um... It's even, like, you, you would think that, like, in current format, if you're going to play Fairies, that, like, yeah, 3 Herald, obviously. I mean, you can't play 3 Herald anymore. But, like, Honest is not a very modern card. <laughs> no one would be playing Honest. I mean, and you have to play Honest in Edison. It's Honest. It's, like, you can search it, you can bounce it, you can do anything you want with it. It's 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 a card that wins every battle, because battle is meaningful in Edison. Uh, funny enough, it's not a modern format. So you can play Bottomless Trap Hole, you can play Dimensional Prison, you can play Honest. It's almost like these cards still see play in retro formats because retro formats aren't modern formats. Even though we can we can pretend to be deck building like we're like we're Patrick Hoban all we want, it doesn't work in older formats. I played for Ribbit Four, no Ribbit Five, Ribbit Four. I don't remember what I played. What did I play? Oh, I played Value Turbo in Ribbit Four. Uh, in Ribbit Five, I played a Machina list I've been working on for weeks. It had uh, it had decree, terrible card, and no battle traps, and I lost to Grand Mole. I lost to I I literally lost to a Grand Mole whose attacks I could not stop. Something that in 2010 
I don't think anyone would have really lost to. No one would have pulled up with Decree in the main deck and not had some deep prisons, at least in the side. I didn't have deep prisons in the side. I had Decree in the main. I was like, yeah, it's trap cards. I'm not. I'm just not going to take out Decree unless I'm against Lightsworn. And then I don't want prison because I'd, I'd just rather have Bottomless. Well, guess what card can't hit uh, New Space and Grand Mall? Well, that would be Bottomless Trample, which is the worst card ever printed, by the way. Um... I took a very modern approach to my Machina deck. I had plays for days, if I didn't brick. Like, it was Cyber Elton in, um, you know, it was like, it was like three Elton in, three Valley, and then two Cyber Dragon, and then like a huge Machina package. And then I had like Hamster, Raikou, Caius, Battle, I didn't, well, did I have Hamster? I don't remember if I had Hamster in that list or not. But I did have a Raikou, Caius, Battle Fader. It was, uh, it was a deck where I intended to just make plays. Like, I, I intended to... Uh, play my game and let my opponent play theirs and just rely on the fact that my game was going to be better. I did not do well that event whatsoever. I would have done better <laughs> with with Jake Mattern's Gladden Beast list, with uh, with Jeff Jones's Quick Draw list. I, I would I would have done better with those literal 2010 lists because of, they're built with the paradigms of a format in mind. Even though they were built for an older version of a format, it's the same format, right? It's like it's astounding to me that people think that these lists are terrible, that they have no redeeming qualities, and that the players at the time didn't know what they were doing when they were making them. So, but you know, this guy was. But anytime I would point that out, this guy was like, "Well, don't pit me against specific players. I pit me against the average player, and I'm better than them." Well, you're not. Any mistakes. See, see, here's the thing. Average players are average. They make mistakes. Even good players make mistakes. I made a huge error in <laughs> playing a stupid Mac in a list with no battle traps and no way to actually like stop my opponent's plays. And I'm pretty decent. I wouldn't say like I'm I'm insane, but I'm pretty decent. And I made a huge error in my meta analysis to to think that I could get away with that. But Edison format has too many decks for me to get away with that. Like, if everyone was on Value Turbo and didn't have Grand Mole, like, I, it was literally a Value Turbo player, by the way. It was um, Masahiro. He uh, he also made it, he, he topped that event. Uh, you know, props to him. He uh, made it to uh, Ribbit Rulers, and he um, he did not top Ribbit Rulers, but neither did I, so I can't really say much. Um, but, you know, that's an error that I can make, and I'm very inundated with Edison format. I know, I know a lot about the format. I've been playing the format since its revival. I, I, before, it's like, like not even this revival, like it's 2015 revival on Duelist Ground. That's how long I've been playing Edison format. And that's a mistake that I stupidly made. I shouldn't, I just, I should have just played a solid deck instead of a special brew that I thought was going to be, you know, the nuts and kill everyone. You know, it's, it didn't. And it happens. It happens to everyone every once in a while. But the idea to me that that this deck should have theoretically done better than any deck in the top 16 of actual Edison format, it like that idea kind of just astounds me in a way. Because it's what people really think. People really think that like a, a deck from 2002 is just better. So when you look at like Jake Mattern's list, the number one, like, first thing you should see is that he does not play Heavy Storm. The second thing you should see is that he does not play Mirror Force. He plays Three Prisons. Three Prisons is good. I like Three Prison right now. Um, James tells me that Three Prison is uh, not that good, but I disagree. I think that I think that J J James plays Two Prison. Two Prison is fine. I like Three right now. But that's beside the point. Um... The fact that battle traps are good at all should be evidence alone that our modern deck building ideas don't work in this format, and that the people who who were building for it in actual 2010 were not dumb. Like they didn't know less than us. The game was different from what we play. So, so when it, so whenever I'm faced with an argument like this, I mean like. You know, there's not much you can do against an opponent who starts saying, kiddo, go play gadgets if you think they're so good. I mean, like, 
Obviously, I'm not saying that I want to play gadgets in tournament, though. If I did, I guess I would. I guess I'd do fine. Gadgets play battle traps, and you can play Phoenix Wing Wind Blast, and the Machina cards themselves are pretty good. I think I think Machina Gadget is probably just better than the Cyber Machina deck, which is funny because I was talking about how bad I think gadgets really are, and I do think gadgets are kind of bad. But it's not really about gadgets being bad. It's about the fact that gadgets are a constant advantage engine. And the cyber stuff is really bricky. And you can kind of play out of the bricks sometimes in older formats. Because, like, the games go longer. But Edison is, I think Edison's too fast to be, to, like, be relying on playing out of bricks. And gadgets just don't brick. Which is not true, but gadgets brick a lot less often. And they can convert their bricks a lot better. Uh, because there's not a lot I can do with a hand of, like, Caius, Eltonen... Trunade, um, Raiko, if, if they can out the Raiko, then I don't even get Caius online, I can't do anything. There, There's, like, legitimately just not a lot that I can do, like, if something happens to a hand like that, and especially if I don't even have a Raiko at all, like, what if I have, like, like, Raiko, Eltonen, or I'm sorry, like, like, Caius, Eltonen, Fortress, Force, like, I can summon Fortress for Huge Neg, I mean, I can true for Caius, it's not, it's not good, though, it's not good, whereas, even in the worst gadget hand that is not literally six gadgets, you have trap cards, you are guaranteed to have some kind of removal, some kind of interruption, and it's almost like Ronaldo Linez knew that. It's almost like Ronaldo Linez knew that by playing Doom Caliber Knight, which is bigger than every Black Wing except Soroka, that by playing a bunch of Battle Traps to stop the Black Wings, cause, and the Flamvel Fire Dog. Flamvel was very big uh, at the time. Flamvel was a very uh, popular deck. Um, it's almost like he knew. It's almost like he had this idea. Hey, you know, maybe if the best decks, or rather at least the most popular decks, are trying to attack me, maybe I should just stop them from doing that. Okay. Oh, clearly that's too large brain for some people. Cle clearly clearly, some people think that, that he should have been on some kind of, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe, he, maybe they think he should have been on Frog Combo and open one for one every game like Dimitri did in, in, in Rip It Rulers. Uh, no, hate to, that deck's actually... That, that deck, I think he has the best version of that deck that, that has been built yet. I still, of course, will always say I don't think the deck is good, but I think that's just me being a hater. Um, uh, props to Dimitri, obviously, he got third place of it. I mean, like, that's better than any bad deck I've ever made, so... <sighs> um, but it's like... But when you look at decks like that, when people, when people who are coming from, like, current format C decks like that, that is immediately, like, their first thought, like, wow, we are so much better than back then. We have, like, look at this, we come up, we came up with this whole new, straight up, just about FTK strategy. We must clearly be much, much better players than everyone was back then. And it just doesn't really work like that. Like, Frog FTK um, became a deck after Rona Totem was released, and Frog FTK was immediately known. I say I say immediately within maybe like a month. You know, people kind of like people people started to have this idea of like, oh, wow, Ronan Toten goes infinite. But you know, they didn't really like you know fully have it formulated how to do it. But you know, after a very short period of time, Frog FTK became no. It didn't take it didn't really didn't take very long to to to, to innovate that to be some ingenious uh, you know Yu-Gi-Oh player who decided to kill your opponent on the first turn. FTKs were nothing new to the game either. We'd had Library FTK uh, 2006 Nats Vincent Tundo Top 64. We'd had a Shadow Freezes of Ohm FTK in uh, um, after Phantom Darkness came out. FTKs were just uh, yeah. Empty Jar was not really an FTK, but a good FTK. It was um pretty. It was it was, it was just like pretty well known that when you see a card that can go infinite, maybe you can FTK with it. And so it didn't take it didn't take long. But obviously before that, before Ronin Toting comes out, it's not so obvious to see that you have some kind of nuts combo. 
And I feel like this deck is uh, why Power Tool was uh, the... Uh, sorry, sorry I, sk I skipped over something. I don't, I don't know if I mentioned it. The, the conversation originally started because someone mentioned Power Tool and Ancient Fairy Dragon being such strong and modern feeling cards. And I'm like, well, Power Tool is actually just completely mid. It's like just, it's just not very good at all. It doesn't search anything good. Um, you know, it has Mar Mark of a Rose, which is Snatch Deal, but it's a very conditional Snatch Deal, which is uh, not so great. And um, DDR. So there's a third target for uh, Power Tool Dragon, which Dimitri used, and it's the only good target for Power Tool Dragon, which is uh, Symbols of Heritage, which is an absolutely absurd card. Um, does not the card does, like Symbols of Heritage? This card doesn't need to exist, much less be unlimited, like unsearchable. Like that's absolutely ridiculous. But uh, so, but yeah, the conversation rose because of Power Tool. But like. You can say all you want that Dimitri innovated a new frog combo deck, which he didn't. It was Frog Slicer, and then Dimitri like improved on it. But that's also beside the point. But it's completely out of completely out of left. Like the mental gymnastics required to go. Well, if we had this deck now and we didn't have it in 2010, then 2010 players must have been behind. They must. They, they just suck. We're so much better than, than we used to be. People like who played back then just they just don't know the game like we know it. They're just not as good as we are. And it just completely ignores the fact that it is a different game. It is it is like the the cards that are dominating the meta game in. Uh, at any given time, are what are obviously what's going to guide your deck building principles, right? And um, it's like I just don't get it. <laughs> I guess that's all I can say. I guess I, I guess I just don't, I just don't get it. Like the, I guess the, their mental like direction in saying something like this is that. The, um, is that like everyone should just be on these decks. Everyone's behind. So it doesn't matter that, that you're building for the right meta, or, or it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't matter that you're building right for the meta. What matters is that everyone is behind. And so we're, and so everyone is, so everyone's just terrible. And so it doesn't matter that, that you're building correctly for them. You're, you're behind because you're not building something broken and stupid. And they're behind because they're not. That's kind of like the logic. That's kind of like the train of thought. Like they're like if Patrick Hoban was playing in 2010, which he was, by the way. But um, if Patrick Hoban were were the top player in 2010, who had discovered all of his 2013 and 2014 theory, he would have dominated the format, which is not true. In fact, uh, Patrick Hoban started topping events in 2010 um, using theories of the time. Uh, he didn't really have new theories to innovate at the time period because the known deck building principles worked for the game. And, he, and he's he's mentioned this. He's, he's actually in, in one of his... Uh, in, he had a three-part article about um, like his like his upbringing in the game. So he had like the early days where he was terrible and just like kind of engaged in game and Yu-Gi-Oh content, but didn't really like, like know the game. Uh, like like he knew the game, but he didn't know the game. You know you know what I mean. Um, then there were his uh, his days where he started topping events. And he started like proving that he was a good player. But there was uh, one person. This is Soul. Um, you, everyone in the Format Library community should know Soul by now. Souls. He's a, he's a good guy, but Soul kind of like really pushed Patrick to be far better because Soul never accepted him as a good player. They were on the same team. And um, so around 2008, 2009, and then into 2010, which is when Patrick started topping, Soul would constantly berate Patrick, telling him that he was like the worst player on the team, that he, he played terrible, that his decks were awful, um, that he just absolutely would not make it on the team, that he, was, that he would drag the team down. And the reason Patrick Hoban topped, 
events started getting better so that he could top events. Was to prove this person, Soul, wrong. Um, so when he does finally, at the end of 2010, start topping events, he comes back to the, to the team chat. This is on Duelist Grounds at the time. He comes back to the team chat and he says, look guys, I got my first top. Like, like, aren't you proud of me? And Soul is just like, I don't care. Soul didn't even play in, in person at this time. Soul had, uh, Soul had quit playing in person. If he, if he, if he even ever, I don't remember if he even actually did play in person at this time. But, um, like, Soul didn't care. I think that, that was, that, that's the crazy thing, is that, like, you know, all the, all, like, all these tops that Patrick, he topped, like, three events back-to-back, -back and Soul just didn't care. Um, Patrick realized that, like, what he was doing didn't really make him a good player. It made, it didn't make him a consistent player, but it wasn't really enough to be, like, a good player, per se. Like, not even up to, like, his own standards had become, like, as high as Soul's. He was, he was, like, set to prove that he was even better than that. And, um, I don't know why I'm going through all this story, and I actually kind of lost my point. Point is, Patrick Hogan was stopping events in 2010 with the theory that we had in 2010. It's, um, the game didn't actually change to, su to support theories where Patrick Hogan started seeing success, because Patrick Hogan's first major success was 2013 Nationals. He had topped plenty of events before then. He was well into the scene of Yu-Gi-Oh, and people didn't know his name. He was like he, he was not like a, a an absolute nobody. But his first foray into like you know being the theory guy, the guy who like absolutely knew everything there was to know about the game, was not until. Um, 2013 Nationals in Dragon Ruler format, where he won. Because that was the first format where he, you can actually change the nature of the theory of the game. Fraser Smith has an article from that time period where he says, um, For the first time in the game's history, Heavy Storm is not a playable card. Everything you know about the game is a lie. The game is completely different. It has been shifted and turned on its head overnight as a release of Lord of Attackion Galaxy. Everything is about to change in this game. Those are kind of a paraphrase, but he does mention the heavy storm thing verbatim, um, which I think that's and I think that's actually a great article. I, I really enjoyed reading that article when, um, when I first stumbled across. It. I didn't stumble across it in 2013, but I did um, a few years ago. You know, finding the backlogs of Frazier's publications, and I was like, wow, you know, he's he's all of the money. This is the game. This is the turning point of the game, where it just turns into something completely and totally different. And that's also, notably, where Patrick Hoban's Road of the Kings type of theories begin. Where his idea of how to build a deck with a certain number of starters, a certain number of extenders... It's the only place in the game's history where you can actually begin functioning with his theories. He was the first person to explore and establish these theories. It was it's obvious why he got so much success from trying. Well So all this is to say that the community annoys me with, with this type of regurgitated arrogance. Because when you when you really get into retro formats, when you really start to play, uh, when you have I don't know when you have a top in a retro format event, when you when you've won even even when you've won something small, a 12, 16, 20 man retro format event, um, but especially once you've got tops in in events as big as ribbits, um, FLCs, GFCs, um, all kinds of uh, uh, goat format Europe tournaments. I don't know um, deck devs. I don't, like you know, there's a lot of big Edison and goat tournaments. When you have tops in those, and I have I have quite a few. I have I have ones people don't know about. Uh, but uh, in due time, and the but but once you have this these sort of tops like. Like me, like uh, Siltus, Beast Mode, um, James, Ronak, 
Um, geez, uh, who else? Like, even Carpath. Carpath's a great player. Um, Souls Manic. Um, I don't think Souls Manic has a ribbit top, actually, which is which sucks. He, he's a great player. He's he's one of the best players I know. Um, Indicud. Um, uh, Pro Storm, obviously. Pro Storm. How, how can I forget Pro Storm? Um, Hydro Pump. You know, like, all of these people, when you have this... You know this base, this this like kind of like platform to stand on, not like a not like a pedestal that you're raised on, but kind of like like it's like like I'm not I'm not trying to say like like we're we're above anyone. I'm trying to say more more along the lines of like when you just just like when, when you when you have this this base of knowledge that you're working with from experience and not and not just like pure not not just knowledge from like having read some things but knowledge from having truly literally experienced them and like kind of seen firsthand exactly how building a deck works in the format you really throw away this idea that people somehow were just bad when the reality is that they were building for a meta that they had to that they had to build for. And and older Edison metas, SJC Edison had like God, it it wasn't two thousand people, but it was I think it was like fifteen hundred people. It was a big SJC. Like, SJCs were not as big as YCSs, but Edison was the last SJC right before it became YCS. It was a Konami SJC. Konami had done a lot more marketing for SJCs than UDE did. Um, they got a lot more players than uh, UDE got from the SJCs. So when there's this huge, diverse field before you, and Historical Edison. People people love to laud Edison from a diversity. It's really not that diverse, by the way. Uh, most of the diversity is pretty artificial. Um, but people love to laud modern Edison for being diverse. But historical Edison, all historical formats, are more diverse at the time. You can call this innovation if you want, but the reality is that people are just kind of like... Uh, Online gameplay lets you play with whatever card you want, and that's kind of a big factor for um for like real events. Like you kind of just can't get every card that you want if you're not a top player already, and like don't have people sponsoring you, or you're just not like rich or something. Like at the time, it was it's it's actually legitimately very hard for like people to to get you know all the cards they need. Um. You have, as like, 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 as a result of that, a much more diverse field to worry about. Much more diverse than modern Edison is. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a streamlined deck. If your if your level of play is high enough, it doesn't matter if your deck's not perfectly streamlined. What's going to happen is uh, you're going to outplay your opponent if you're better than them, or or just or just get luckier than them. It's a, it doesn't really matter. Like they're that's it's the same thing, really. Outplaying, outdrawing, it's it's, it's the same thing. But that's a topic for another day. Um, but like really, what we're working with when we think about it in in these terms, though, is it like. Uh, it, it's 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 kind of hard to put into words like right now because uh, the refining doesn't matter. I guess I guess I should say like a refined deck is not the deck that wins an event, it, and in, even today it's not. The, you will you'll never find a perfectly streamlined deck winning an event. Uh, one of the examples I used in the in my argument with this guy was um uh what's his name uh. Ryan, Ryan Yu, I think that's his name. Uh, anyway, a guy who won some YCS with Sky Strikers. Playing Offerings to the Doomed in the main deck. Specifically, 
specifically to lose tempo. And I don't like using the word tempo in, in, in Yu-Gi-Oh, really, because I don't think it like has a great definition in Yu-Gi-Oh. But I like using it here, because it's a chess term. And you know, I'm going to get a lot of groans from half the audience now. Um, the idea that, like... Um, if you, if it's your move and you don't want to make a move or you need to like be a, like a move like after your opponent do something you can like just like move your king or uh, like a certain like like the opposite direction from where he needs to go and then move him back and it loses a tempo and puts you where and puts you where you need to be it's, it's called it's called losing a tempo so he played offering to the doom specifically to lose a tempo to to get rid of a draw phase he played it with the express intention to not draw a card. And that would put his opponent on the deck out when he has Mystic Mind up, and they can't out it. It's completely non-standard tech. There's absolutely no way anyone is thinking on that level when they're building a deck, unless they're the person who's going to go on to win the event, or at least top it. Uh, he didn't actually. Was that the one where he got? Was it... that was Nats, wasn't it? No, the thing that was Nats. He got second place. Point is. No one, no one's thinking like that unless we're going to do well at the event. And it's exactly that type of deck building that has seen success both in the modern day and in older, um, uh, in, in older formats. So one thing, whenever we talk about Jeff Jones's list, um, I still talk to Keegan a, a bit, and, um, Anytime Jeff Jones' list comes up, he mentions that Night Assailant's not very good, but it goes crazy. Because recycling Ryko with Night Assailant can just win versus certain decks. And he's completely right. Night Assailant is well known to not be that good. I'm pretty sure Jeff Jones knew, going into SJC Edison 2010, that Night Assailant, that the combo that he was going for was not that consistent, that he was not really going to achieve that combo as much as he wanted. But he knew. He knew that against the first seven rounds of opponents, chances are, he resolves a Night Assailant loop with uh, to get Raikou back with Drill Warrior, and he wins the game. I can guarantee you, that was his thought process. It was to just have a play in his deck that if his opponent's deck was not as good as his, he would just win the game. And that's exactly what he did several times. The goal was not to have the most consistent deck. The goal was not to have the most optimal deck. And the goal for anyone who's ever won a tournament is not to have the most optimal deck. It's to have the deck that has the best chance of making your opponent's plays useless or just completely and totally auto-winning against them because everyone everyone loves free rounds. The, the point of building a deck to be very, very good is to not even have to try to win. It's to get free. It's to literally get free wins. Uh, yes, Johnny Lee. <laughs> Johnny Lee in one of his GoatFormat.com interviews was like, uh, uh, he, I think he had a buy or something. He was like, I was really happy about it because I didn't want to play. I wanted free wins. And it's like, a lot of, a lot of people are too arrogant to admit that. Johnny Lee's not. He he says uh he says he has no no shame and no pride in, in it. He's just like yeah. I mean I want to win the tournament, so I want free wins. And that's exactly the mindset that goes into playing a card like Night Assailant. So when you look at older decks, it you you are completely tunnel visioned. Or not you, not 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 you as a listener. If you're listening this far and you haven't been offended by the things I'm saying, then you probably just agree with me. But but when people that think that like you know older players are just not good, the older average player is terrible. Let, let me let me tell you something, buddy. Let me tell you something. You are no better than them because you are both just copying lists that you found off the internet, except they found them in a magazine instead. Simple as that. If you try to build your own deck. For the meta, as you see it today, you will probably fail just as hard. Any mistakes, I, and this is one, this is universal. This is universal. Like average players make mistakes. Any mistake that you would make building a deck now, like any failure to account for the meta appropriately, you would make the same mistake in accounting for the meta of the retro format if you went back in time. You wouldn't. Yeah. Here's the thing. You can take a modern Edison deck to SJC Edison. 
And you're going to play against a gadget player, maining oppression, and he's going to draw up both games. And you're going to go, how did I lose? How how could I have possibly lost? Well, it's because you played a deck from Modern Edison that doesn't respect main deck oppression because a main deck oppression is bad because the best deck doesn't lose to it. Well, guess what? The best decks in 2010 Edison didn't lose to it either. Funny enough. But people are still playing it because it's oppression. They had PTSD from, from the Teledad opponent slipping oppression. It was very obvious. Oh, oppression is such a good card, right? Have to, I have to play oppression because it's, it's oppression. So you're going to lose with your optimal deck to someone playing a suboptimal deck, and you're going to go, well, how can this happen? Well, it's because you made a failure to account for the meta at the time, and these players who topped and won the event didn't. Are their decks, in hindsight, kind of silly looking? Oh, yeah, sure. But, uh... Anyway, this, this this video this video is just a rant. Anyway, I don't I don't actually care about explaining any deep level theory that can that we can do that another time. I I have, I have a video lined up. I, I it was um I was going to make that one first, but I decided to make this one instead. Um, but the uh, but yeah. So basically, like the the idea is is that like. It's just this weird tunnel vision on, like, flaws in deck building. Like, you're, like you're trying too hard to point out flaws to justify saying that you're better than, like, older players. Like, when it's just a different game. A lot of people like say Yu-Gi-Oh is Yu-Gi-Oh, and in a, in a way it is, but really, it, it's not. It's, it's like... There are a lot of differences, and it, the differences are even more astounding when you like go back further in time. Like Edison's a pretty modern retro format, all things considered. Like, like a lot of times, a turn one play just wins the game because you can't really do much about it. And um, like that happened to me in uh, in Ribbit Rulers. I played uh, in game two against a true hero. He goes first. And he opens the nuts. He opens like Stardust, Goyo, uh, something else. Yeah, he had three Synchros turn one. I couldn't have them. Like, I had Icarus and Mirror Force and Solemn. I, I remember I had that. And I, I just could not do anything. Like, like his... Like, he, he set up a turn one board. Like, it's like it's 2022. Like, he was playing, I don't know, like... Despia or something. Like, or no negates in it. But, well, I guess, again, Stardust is negate. The point is... He set up a board I couldn't beat. That doesn't happen in GOAT format. That's, that, I mean, Teledad's, like, I think the first format where that can happen, because because of Synchros. Like, Teledad is often cited as being, like, the first modern format. It's like, uh, MMF has actually said something that every format after Teledad is, like, a, uh, what's the word for it? A, uh... I don't know, it's not a callback, but, like, uh... A footnote. I think he said a footnote. A footnote to Teledad. Because Teledad started this idea of make a board, turn one, set oppression, and win the game. You just make Colossal Fighter, you set oppression, your opponent can't play the game anymore. That was, you know, that's the Teledad strategy as of, like, January in the format. Houston, I think, was the SJC that oppression... But like the oppression, the the one telly, two Krevins stuff came about. Pretty sure that was pretty sure that was the SJC. Um, and every and every once in a while in in Edison format, you get that type of game. And it's not really a problem with the format per se. I mean, it's it's a problem with the game more so. Um, but I'm not here to complain about that. I can complain about that in any video. But, um, the point I was trying to make is, yes, Edison is a bit more of a modern format than, than like, you know, older retro formats like, uh, like, like Go or, or Perfect Circle. Like, those are, those are probably my two favorite retro formats. Um, maybe Critter, which is as old as it gets without being terrible. I'm sorry, Yugi Kaiba players, but your format sucks. Um, so, but the way I see it, is that like it doesn't matter how modern it is, it's still a different game. It's like it's it's only modern because we've tried to 
streamline decks in a modern way. And every single tournament, you see these decks doing well, but you're going, but you see decks that just play 40 good cards sometimes, it feels like, are also up there in the top tables with them. We've seen Gladiator Beast topping back-to-back -back deck devs. People think Gladiator Beasts are dead in the water. And, well, are Gladiator Beasts bad in Edison format? They're, they're, they're shadowed a lot, but they're a lot more competent, competent than anyone likes to give credit for. Um, I mean, I will tell you first, you know, like first thing in the morning when I wake up, oh, Glad suck. Yeah, you know, Glad's are my favorite deck, but I'll tell, I'll tell you, like, Glad suck. They're, they're not, they're not good. They're, you, know, you can't play them. They're not great. Just uh, don't try. Just, just don't waste your time. But they have topped two deck devs in a row. Something that many decks can't say. So. Basically, I guess, the whole point of this video is just to rant about how arrogant I think the community is, and it's not just arrogance, it's like, it's, it's one thing to be arrogant, like, Johnny Lee's arrogant, but he's a good player. Um, I'm arrogant, but, well, not, well, like, point is, we're not that much smarter. <laughs> And we're, I don't think we're smarter at all. And I don't think the average player is much better than the average player from uh, 2010. I don't think, well, you know, like, the internet has not helped most players get better at the game. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that outright. There are plenty of players who are just bad. And there are always going to be players who are just bad, because the average player is just bad. It doesn't matter if they're, like... If they don't instantly lose the game on turn one, like that, because that was never happening anyway, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. there's there's no real, there's, I guess I'm just saying, there's no real meaningful metric for determining like how good the average player is. Like, like what is being good in Yu-Gi-Oh? Is it like sequencing? Is it like meta knowledge? Because players are just as bad, if not worse. Honestly, like you can't teach sequencing. Um. You can't ingrain concepts like in in people without them uh, without them like putting the work themselves. Um, like like what is like what is a concept that like players are like bad at and have always been bad at? Like um, oh, we were talking about it in format library earlier before I recorded this video. Who's the beatdown? Um, James will tell you. And I, I guess I'll also tell you it's like it's kind of a shortcut for uh, an understanding of the game that you that you just kind of get when you're there, and you, like, it's not a question you really actually ask yourself or anything like that. And um, it's kind of like overstated, like how much it applies to you. Yeah. But point is, it's still a a an issue with with players. Players are not very good. At figuring it out, and um, I would say, that, oh my god, I would say that um, that when it comes to these concepts, like just because the average player like has like a slightly superior understanding of like combos and deck building. That's just because that's the game. The average player is playing the game. The average player knows that they need to be comboing to build a deck unless they're flipping nine floodgates. Yes, nine. It's possible. I, trust me. I've done it. Anyway. Um, but, yeah, the, but the average player's understanding of the game is only improved because of the nature of the game. The... The reality is that the players themselves are not improved in, like, the game. So, the average player is still terrible at figuring out who's who in the game. The average player is still terrible at, um, at, like, uh, sequencing their plays to be the best, like, 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 ordering their plays the best. Um, and 
the average player is still pretty not good at uh, making optimal decks either. In fact, you know, like it doesn't like you can't really teach for deck building. You can you can teach you can you can teach for deck building, but you can't really teach for deck building. And um, it's like. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, so I, I just feel like the average player is not actually significantly better. And if you ask um, a player like Vera, who was the person who really first made that apparent to me, uh, actually, she posted a Twitter post, a tweet about, um, she said something like, the average player is not significantly better than um, the average player from back in the day, but the decks are, so you can't like randomly lose to some idiot with rank 10 trains and I was like you're so right you know like like players still suck but but the decks are a lot better so it makes it look like the players are better and um and I guess it's just one of those things you know where like people are ultimately never really going to like fully grasp that like their own understanding of a game is not exceptional maybe mine's not I would like to think that it is not maybe not exceptional but definitely at least pretty good this is this just kind of just, just kind of a general rant on you know, it just it just made me think about like why I kind of feel like I stay away from the Yu-Gi-Oh community, <laughs> like, and why a lot of like top players try to stay away from Yu-Gi-Oh community because they just they just say stuff that like is just really untrue, and um. So, yeah, that's my rant for this video. I'm kind of getting in a lot of empty space now. Um, if you like the Yu-Gi-Oh content, or if you think I'm a dumbass, let me know in the comments. If you like the RuneScape comment, con comment content, let me know. And uh, if you don't, then I don't care. I'm still gonna have to record something while I do this, and so you might as well see me grind to. 99 magic on my pure. So, um, yeah, I will probably record something else later. I'll see you guys. And, um, if I never upload again, don't be surprised.